in constituency offices for the Labour Party. So oh. doing a couple couple days a week for no money. You probably then, made the best drinks of studying. anyone in the Labour Party. Um, I, 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 I'm still a member. I, I, I think I probably, to this day, am still probably, yes, the best drink slinger in the Labour Party. Um, <laughs> Hello and welcome to Best Sips Worldwide. I'm your drinking companion, Susan Schwartz, an American travel writer living in London. Thanks to my mother's love of martinis, the first words I spoke were shaken, not stirred, and I've been obsessed by the history of cocktails ever since. Through the years, I've been lucky enough to sip some of the best made by the best. Hear that sound? It's time to cozy up to the bar and let me introduce you to the movers and shakers of the world's most famous watering holes. Two spirits that might have had their time and place in the past are now finding a new audience in contemporary drinking establishments. That's thanks to our guests today, Michael Mann and Jess Milley. Michael, as the UK brand ambassador of both 1770s hit Bowles Geneva and that 1970s favorite Galliano, and Jess as the Bowles Around the World Champion 2017. We met to have a chat at Joyal Bordal Cocktail Club in London. So basically, um, back when I was 20, I went to university in Nottingham. Um, I'd actually done a year of, of law in Sheffield, my hometown, before I did this. I took a year out in the middle of that, and then I went... Basically, I, I decided I really wanted to leave home. Um, so um, Nottingham was the, the place that I'd been and visited the most and wanted to go to, because I thought it was a pretty cool city. Um, lots of sort of young, cool people, I thought, walking around. So I was like, that's where I'll go. I went to study politics. When I was studying law, my favourite aspect of law was the constitutional side of it so uh, the other stuff the sort of the contract law the talk was a bit dry so I decided to to just focus on the stuff that I liked and do a politics degree um, I needed to work as I studied so I worked the whole time I, I was actually working in the lead up to going to Nottingham in kind of a well known sports chain over here um, High Street um, and I decided that I didn't want to do that anymore um, so I was like I'm going to get a better job um, so I kind of just walked around, walked around town one day with this, with a CV and was like, I'm just going to go anywhere I think looks looks like it might be a cool, fun place to work. And I happened to drop a CV in at a little theatre bar in Nottingham called Cast, and um, I guess that's where that's where I started my stint behind the stick, uh, and that lasted for over ten years up until I started my at my the same role. place. Um, no, not at the same place. Um, I've moved around the UK a little bit, worked in different cities, um, uh, but uh, I guess the start of my time in bartending, I had a great time at Cast, it was a great team, my best friends at university were the people I was working alongside with, really other than a couple of people um, you know, who I'm still, still friends with today, um, and yeah, I just liked hanging out with those guys, it was a great camaraderie, and you know, we would go around the city of Nottingham, and the bartenders knew each other, it was quite compact, the city centre there, so... You could go. You always there was always you know places to go drink and go go have a good time. Um, and uh, yeah, I was still obviously I was still studying. I was actually I got bumped up fairly quickly to sort of an assistant manager position in the bar I was working. So I did thirty hours a week behind the bar plus trying to finish my degree. That was tough, um, but I kind of got used to doing two things at once. So I did that for quite a long time. So after finishing my policy degree in Nottingham, I moved to Newcastle. Um, with my partner at the time, um, we were going to save some money to go travelling, so I was I started at a bar called Popolo, um, which was a pretty well-known bar in that city, um, and I worked, I guess, with some um, some great peers, there were some bartenders there at the time, Tom Walker was one of them, um, and we were all kind of coming up together and we were all very enthusiastic, so I guess that's where I really got the, the cocktail bug, if you like, a cast, it was... It was more about um, learning kind of the basics. You know, we served a lot of beer, we served wine, it was a restaurant on the side. I had a great manager called Chico who gave me a good grounding, but it wasn't really a sort of a dedicated cocktail bar. When I got to Popolo, it was like 
we're making a lot of cocktails and we're, we're, we're very busy on a Friday, Saturday night and you're, you know, half of what you're doing is making cocktails and the other half is, you know, opening bottles of beer, things like that. Um, Do you think that being, it was in Newcastle that you said, okay, forget the think, politics and law, um, this is going to be my the, life? I got the cocktail bug, I would say, if you like, you know, um, I was working with like-minded people and we were all very enthused. People like Tom, I have a good friend called Ewan, you know, who's one of my best buddies to this day. Um, and we kind of thought the same way about things, if you like, and we were going and buying books, you know, I picked up my, my first copy, my first cocktail book, 2008, you know, whilst working there, um, and that was David Rogers' Imbibe, and I'm, I'm into my history, you know, the brand that I work for now has a lot of that, um, and I was hooked, I'd say, from there. I didn't necessarily turn my back on the politics and the studying, so I was still for a while in Newcastle working. We went travelling, me and my partner, for about you know almost a year, uh, and then I came back. I was working and interning, working behind the bar full time and interning a couple of days a week. Um, I came to London, followed my partner at the time down here because uh, she got a job, um, and I was like, London would be a great place to go, and work behind the bar as well and maybe I could do some more I felt like I wanted to go and do some more study um, so I actually went and did a master's degree oh boy um, at King's College here in, in politics London. as well um, it was it was in that sphere yeah it was it was politics with an environmental slant so um, kind of big picture how do we deal with legislate for the environmental issues that we're facing in the world today it was super interesting yeah um I had a great time doing that course, but again, I was still, still working. Still felt the you know, ball. Um, almost full time behind the bar. Uh, when I got to my last few months of masters, I dropped down to kind of a couple of shifts a week. Um, in a little, a little dive bar called the Exhibit in Southwest London, which again, great team. My best friends in London, uh, the guys I met working working there really, um, and then. After I did my, finished my master's degree, I was interning again. I was actually working for in constituency offices for the Labour Party, so oh, doing a couple couple days a week um, for no money. You and probably then, made the best drinks of studying. anyone in the Labour Party. Um, I, 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 I'm still a member. I, I, I think I probably to this day and still probably yes, the best drink slinger in the Labour Party. Um, so so yes, I basically was. I did about six months of that and was like, I'm pretty strong out here. I've been doing two things for a long time, I just need to concentrate on one thing. Um, so, basically, my boss at the dive bar I was working in kind of said to me one week, there's a cocktail competition going on, it's a, it's, it was a Jameson thing, um, and he said, next week, turn up this day and make a cocktail. Didn't really tell me what the brief was on the comp, and oh boy. me being... Um, I keep saying, oh boy, oh boy, these pretty, are all amazing uh, things. Pretty lazy at the time, was like, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to... I didn't actually go and check if there was a refund of that, so I just came up with a nice drink, went and um, put a nice drink together that didn't fit the brief of the competition at all, but gave a great chat um, around Jameson. So I actually was given a second place prize, which was a bottle of Jameson 12 year old with my name on it, which I've still got unopened in my house. But you wouldn't advise not looking at the yeah, brief? Yeah, I would before. definitely say, look at the brief... Read the brief, read the brief, read the brief, read the brief. Jeff will tell you that, I'm sure, as well. Um, uh, so, so yeah, I'd, I felt like after I'd done this great chat, I was like, okay, so I'm pretty good at this. Let's just spend some time focusing on this. Um, so did a couple more little bits and bobs, comps, put my face out there, and ended up having um, a leap into central London in a really nice place called City of London Distillery. Um, I was there for two and a half years, um, you know, it's a gin distillery, a functional gin distillery. As I was there, the brand was sort of growing, adding new products there, so it was fun to be kind of part of the, part of that process as somebody's whose opinion was valued to give you taste. I'm asked to tell Jonathan Clark would give us tasters of the new stuff he was coming up with. Um, and eventually, you know, kind of took the reins of what we were doing drinks-wise behind the bar there. Um, we were hosting tours of that distillery, and we did... They do gin making sessions there as well, so we were hosting those. So I spent a lot of time doing that. Um, so you really got to so know then, how drinks were made. Yeah, I mean, you know, from the beginning. all ends of, of the a lot of insight into a lot of aspects of the industry. Working in that in that one place, I would say, you know, um, and obviously like learning a lot about 
juniper flavoured spirits as well, working in a, in a gin distillery and, you know, doing daily chats that lasted for, you know, at least an hour about, mm -hmm. about, about the stuff. Um, so kind of, yeah, got the bug. I mean, I've always had the bug, but it felt then that it's like, okay, this is what I should be, I should be doing. So let's, you know, I guess it wasn't really up until, I guess, partway through working at Sivan so it was like, this is what I should be doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this feels, this feels super comfortable. I never, I never, when I was, if I go back to even when I did my undergraduate degree at university, like I hated standing up and doing presentations and things like that. And then, you know, fast forward nine, ten years later, I'm doing, present, d chatting about, about something I love for, you know, an hour at a time to a group of 15 so maybe up to about 30, 40 people at times, you know, on a daily basis. Who really want to hear about it. Yeah, exactly, yeah. People have paid good money to come and, to come and uh, learn something about something that they like. So, you know, show and, them a good time. And something yeah. that gives pleasure. Now, Jess, let, let's bring you in. You're here. Um, so you told me before that you're kind of new to this. And I was wondering what led you from where you were before to where you are now. Not super new to bartending per se, but kind of new to competing. I haven't been doing competitions for, it's gonna be a year now, just a year. I started bartending just like Michael did, and I think a lot of bartenders do to pay my way through university. I was studying criminology and sociology at the University of Toronto. Um, started bartending to pay, to pay my way through school, and I ended up just falling in love with what I was doing with hospitality. I think mostly with people having the opportunity to interact with people and make someone's day and meet people coming from all sorts of walks of life has is really the highlight of my career I think um, so I didn't actually finish school I started slinging drinks and I had one cocktail that changed my life you know watched one bartender making drinks and tasted a Corpse of Rubber number two and left that bar telling myself that I want to make cocktails. I want to be that guy. So now we're here. <laughs> and so what led you to compete? I, I think I've always been kind of competitive. I like challenging myself. I like putting myself in uncomfortable situations, just getting outside of my comfort zone. So I think that's what it was. Mm -hmm. um, it's really humbling to be recognized amongst your peers and that's what I was going for. Had you ever created drinks at your bar? Before? Definitely, yeah, definitely. So you had it in you? I think so, I think yeah. we all do. <laughs> it's it just a drink, just right? actually entering the competition. <laughs> you know, you weren't as, as cocky as Michael here. Oh, I, I'm still not. Hopefully you read the brief, right? I did read the you brief. You did read the brief. I think I did all right. Always read the brief, guys. <laughs> Always read the brief. So how did you guys get involved with balls? Um, so, I um, basically I was probably shouldn't say this. Um, the job came up as a cocktail competition for my for my role, um, and I actually applied late. Um, so, I was working a Friday night at Cold and was sent an email through Bar, Bar Life UK. Um, These are the rules how not to compete, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> late, um, don't read the brief. Yep. Yeah, on a, I was on a mailing list, I guess, because I'd done a few competitions through them throughout the year. So they were obviously looking last minute to get a few more entrants. I hadn't even seen this thing because it was on the jobs page, not on the competition page of their website. And I wasn't really looking at the jobs page because I was fairly happy with what I was doing. Um, so it comes through and I was like, oh, that looks great. Um, I'll have a look at you tomorrow because I'm busy right now selling drinks. Um, full room of people. Um, and uh, I had a look at it the next day and I saw the deadline was Friday. So this is on Saturday. Um, and I was like, oh, man, I would have loved to do that. Uh, and so I mulled over it for an entire day. But the deadline day. was on yeah, Friday? deadline's right. gone. <laughs> I mulled over it for an entire day and I was like, I thought to myself, you know what, they're probably not going to look at these until Monday. So let me just send something over. So on the Sunday, I sent over, we had to, we had to submit two drinks and a 20 word definition of Geneva, um, Bob's Geneva. And um, I thought, yeah, let's, let's do it. So I quickly just came with a couple of drinks, you know, tweaks on drinks that I actually had on the menu at, at cold at the time. So that was fairly simple and quickly just came up with a nice little 20 word summary of. Of what? What was your I summary? Um, Do you remember it? I think it was something along the lines of from a shed to a global empire, Bowles Geneva is history in a bottle. 
Nice. Oh, good. That was That's it. a good yeah. one. Um, <laughs> so, now, did you know a lot about bowls? Um, never before? We were actually using it on a tasting we were doing at Cole called the Evolution of Gin. So it would start, that tasting would start with the Geneva. Um, and so on a weekly basis, that, that was kind of the session that I would always definitely host if I was there I would be doing that session and I was there every Tuesday pretty much so um, so I chatted about it a lot for I guess about two years um, so I knew a fair amount about it the category of Geneva is one that I've as I mentioned I'm into my history you know it's kind of it's the great great granddaddy of gin so it's something that I learned a fair amount about and you know I was in a bar that we were selling gin all the time um, if you can give them something that you know has a commonality but a difference flavour wise it was nice to pick up Geneva and talk to people about it and make them some classic cocktails with it so yeah because I don't that, think that many people realise the connection um, the historical connection unless you're really into history and you're you know you guys do yeah I think, but I think someone um, going into a bar doesn't really equate Geneva with gin like the precursor to gin you're probably right I think consumers definitely um, it's not something that they're massively aware of there are a lot of people working in the gin world now that will pay reference to it you know um, they'll talk about you know William of Orange becoming the King of England and uh, bringing this Dutch stuff over with him it's a quick little story to tell there's, there's, a, there's a lot more to it than that you know um, uh, but you're probably right I think we're getting there though you know gin's pretty popular right now and the more yeah it's a great time for Ginevra probably think so. as yeah, well yeah, on the back of that I think so I think mm-hmm. so it's a great time to particularly you know for, for me going around and talking to bartenders about it it's, it's something that that they're keen to learn about. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. mm-hmm. Galliano as well? Uh, Galliano, you know, it's it's this... So the first cocktail I ever made was a Harvey Wallbanger. Um, I made one Harvey Wallbanger back in, I think, 2000 and, 2007 when I started bartending, and then I think I made one, and then the only time I ever touched the bottle of Galliano, which was a 70 centimetre one, they were nice and tall, those ones, was to turn off a light switch I couldn't reach in the bar I was working at at the time. <laughs> Me and my boss at the time, you know, not the tallest of gentlemen, so we were using this this bottle and that's all we used it for um, but there's a lot of history to this brand as well um, you know uh, it's been marketed great throughout history it's particularly uh, Italians it's kind of um, you know it's, it's initial kind of rise was it being marketed at Italians who were moving to North America and then and then 1960s we see we see the Harvey Wallman that starts to be pushed and that right I was thinking that it's, a, it's kind of a 60s 70s drink yeah absolutely well it was a great advert that went out um uh, late 60s, early 70s, the, the, the guy distributing Galliano in, in the US came up with it. It, was, it had a picture of, you know, the Harvey Wolbanger character um, surfing, and it said, My name is Harvey and I can be made. And this advert was everywhere, um, and um, people started making them, you know, lots of people started making them. It's so was, simple, but so yeah, effective. Incredible piece of marketing. And Galliano was the number one selling liqueur throughout the 1970s in the US on the back no of this campaign. Mm-hmm. People were making Harvey Wallbangers, Golden Cadillacs, and all these kind of super 70s, 80s style drinks, which are actually, you know, underrated, I would say. Well, I think now with the cocktail world the way it is, you know, people want to drink those kind of drinks that they heard about before and, you know, from their parents maybe, kind of like the gin and tonic here. You know, so yeah, many absolutely. people say, yeah. oh, my Nana drank that. And so it was always around. Now it's cool to drink it. And I think drinks like Harvey Wallbanger, Definitely. You know, definitely have a cachet. Do you feel that too? I feel that way, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, I think in contemporary times, uh, right now, having fresh ingredients is really an in thing. So reimagining these old drinks with the modern take of freshness um, has been awesome. Mm-hmm. I'm really excited about it. Mm-hmm. And for your competition, what was the cocktail that you created? Uh, the cocktail that I took through to the end of the competition is called Still Life. Um, so kind of feeding on the freshness thing and what inspired it, what was part of the competition was creating a drink that is easy to replicate around the world. So the cocktail that I made had Bulls Geneva with, um, the Bulls Maraschino liqueur infused with cinnamon, some fennel juice. So I took fennel bulbs, cut them up and juiced them in a high powered juicer, blended that with sugar and salt. So salted fennel syrup, some lemon juice, and fino sherry. It's pretty simple. It's stuff that you can find pretty much anywhere. And if it's pretty good, if I do say so myself. <laughs> it sounds delicious. It's fennel juice. What a great idea. Fennel juice. Mm-hmm. So you can get these little salted 
licorice candies in Amsterdam, which is kind of what inspired the thought for the drink. Oh, I love those. I know it is specific to, to Amsterdam, definitely. And do you guys go to, have you been to Amsterdam? Well, Since you've the won? final of the competition took place in Amsterdam, so they flew seven finalists from around the world and some brand ambassadors to Amsterdam for four days uh, just to do some seminars, learn about the history of the company, and get to know each other, and then of course compete. Mm -hmm. And then I spent a few days after the competition in Amsterdam as well. Mm -hmm. It's a really wonderful city. And what are you going to be doing as champion? So the prize for the competition is traveling the world with bowls. So the first stop is Four Tales of the Cocktail in New Orleans. It's the largest cocktail um, what's the like word? conference, conference I, guess. I guess, in the world. So I'll be representing bowls there, as well as going to Tokyo to learn how to carve ice with Japanese bartenders. I'm really excited about that. And of course, spending time with Pete, who is the master distiller at Bowles, learning exactly how Bowles Geneva is made. And when do you get to go back to Canada in your home bar? Um, I'm actually returning to Canada later next month, um, and I'll be hopping around kind of all year. But I've already gotten opportunities. I'm going to Stockholm this weekend to do some sessions with bartenders there, talk about cocktail competitions, and talk, talk about Bowles Geneva. So I'm sure opportunities like that are going to keep popping up as well. I'm sure they are. Now, as brand ambassador, what have you been doing with Bowles? Um, so I've been sort of in role for around six months. So mainly the first few months was kind of just getting to know uh, the bartending community and introducing myself, you know, to the people using it. Um, you know, um, now kind of settled in, bedded in, done a few events, you know, um, done a few trainings with bartenders as I mentioned it seems to be one that's fairly well received they seem to enjoy it um, and you know um, a lot of admin which is you know new for me having just worked in small teams for, for 10 years uh, behind bars you know I'm part of bowls are distributed by Maxim UK over here so that's a big entity they have a lot of products and a huge team you know of, you know 300 plus people um, uh, UK wide so it's it's been it's been um, a bit of a culture shock, if you like, but it's been great. Everybody at Maxim's lovely. Um, everybody at Bowls is fantastic. Um, I've been able to go to Amsterdam quite a lot as well. Do you miss making a drink here and there? Um, I would say, yeah, I'm starting to get that itch to step behind the bar again. We, we're doing a similar event to the one that Jess mentioned in, in Stockholm here in the UK as well. So hopefully I can go and, you know, get Jess her ice or something like that. <laughs> Do a bit of barbacking for her, step behind the bar. Um, I think as uh, as I move forward, I'll get to do things every now and then, which is nice, you know. Well, I'm going to have you make me a drink right now because I'm getting thirsty, okay? Sounds good. It was so exciting to catch Jess on the start of her world tour as champion. You can catch Michael and me at Also Festival in Warwickshire the last weekend in June, talking Harvey Wallbangers and Espresso Martinis. If you want more information on Also Festival, please go to their website, www.also-festival.com. But before that, Jess's competition-winning Cocktail Still Life is our Cocktail of the Week. You're going to have to shake this one, so go get your shaker. Then grab a few fennel bulbs and put them in a juicer. Juice the whites and blend with sugar, about one to one, then add to taste. Now grab that shaker and add 45 ml of Bowles Geneva, then 15 ml of Tio Pepe Fino Sherry, then 22.5 ml of lemon juice, 15 ml of that yummy salted fennel syrup you just made, and then top it off with 5 ml of cinnamon maraschino. Shake it all up with ice, then strain it into a chilled cocktail glass, serving it up. That means no ice. Sip it and then go to YouTube to watch her video. The link will be on my post at bestbitsworldwide.com. Next week, it's from Holland to Flanders we jump to the University City of Ghent. There we'll meet with Jordan and Tina, who developed their grandmother's elderflower liqueur into a national drink. Until next time, bottoms up. 
For more information and links to everything you've heard about, plus a bit more, please visit bestbitsworldwide.com. Thanks for listening to Best Sips Worldwide, a spin-off of Best Bits Worldwide. Always remember the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation, and never drink and drive. Okay, I said that last part. Theme music is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. You'll find me at the bar. Bye.